All right, guys, if you haven't already, go ahead and pull out the United Church app if you want to follow along with me or your Bible and your notebook. Um, this whole series has been one where we've learned a lot. I've taught a lot. And I hope that you've been able to gain from it. It has been like, like when I say it's been a blast for me, this has been such a blast for me because I'm such an uber nerd and I've got to nerd out for this entire series. And it's been so, so great. And so thank you for letting me do things like this. We're going to be in Leviticus chapter 25. For any of you who don't want to look at the app, you'd rather have your Bible and your notebook. We're in Leviticus 25. Um, I'm not going to recap the entire series today. It takes too much time. If you, if you want to know where we've been, you can go look where we've been. Everything's online. You can go see it. It's been good. But the overarching theme, I will remind you, the book of Leviticus was written for the Levites, which were the priests in the time of the Old Testament. Now, I, when, I, when I look at the New Testament, um, and again, this isn't a, an opinion of me. I think this is what the New Testament says. Um, the New Testament believers, those of you who are filled with the Holy Spirit and covered with the blood of Jesus, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. And so the book of Leviticus was written to priests to know how to be priests and to show the world God. And guess what? You are those priests and you need to know how to show the world Jesus. You need to know how to show the world God. And so that's what we've been talking about this whole time. That's what everything that happens in the book of Leviticus is geared to teaching people how to show God to a world who doesn't know him. And we really need to understand how to do that. And today in particular, um, as we finish up our time together, we're looking at some practices in Israel that on their own have nothing to do with your life. But I'm telling you, there are principles in these practices that will radically change your life and have the capacity to change the lives of everyone around you. So um, it's gonna be a lot of fun today. Let's just jump in, no further ado, Leviticus chapter 25. We normally been starting at verse one, but today we're starting at verse eight. You can go read verses one through seven um, on your own. They're really good. But I wanted to go ahead and jump in uh, to the, like, the meat of what we're talking about today. And so no further ado, here it goes. And you shall... And you shall, and I promise I'll explain everything after we read it. You shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself. Seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, that'll be 49 years for any of you math people. Yeah, 49, seven times seven is 49. Then you shall cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. And you shall make the trumpet sound throughout all the land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year. You will proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. See, this is, a, all right, this is a classic example of a text in Leviticus that when you read this, you're like, this, this is stupid. It's like, you know, what, is it, what, like, what does it mean? What's going on here? Like, it, it, this is a, an example. If you're new to us, like, this is an example of why the book of Leviticus is so hard. But this is so good, y'all. This is so good. So let me give you a little explanation as to what's happening in these passages. And I think once you see what's happening here, you'll be like, man, this is really, really good. Okay, so the people of Israel for hundreds of years, they had been in slavery in Egypt. Again, if you haven't read those stories, man, they're amazing. Go to the book of Exodus, um, into the book of Genesis and kind of see that part of their story. They were, they were in Egypt and their value as humans in Egypt was based on one thing and one thing alone. They were valuable based on how much they could produce. And in particular, it seems like the Egyptians used most of the Israelites to produce bricks to build things. And so um, they were slaves. Their whole life was controlled by the Egyptian people and their value was determined on how good are you do at doing what we need you to do, which is make bricks for us. They were a group of human doings, not a group of human beings. Now, what does this have to do with 2024 20, Americans, because, you know, surely we're not in any form of slavery ourselves. You know, we're in the most free country that's ever existed in human history. And like, that is absolutely, by the way, true. Um, but so what does this have to do with us? Like, though we are not enslaved, enslaved formally, I would dare say that the value system of Egypt, you are valued on what you do and what you produce, is very, very alive in the value system of America. You might not be formally a slave, but we tend to ju judge people's value on how good are you at what you do? What can you produce? How, how, how many people know your name? What, how many zeros do you have at the end of your salary? We are a culture that very, very, very much values doing and producing. And that's not necessarily bad, but it can be very spiritually destructive. So one of the things God wanted Israel to do is that, listen, listen, you can't work every day can't work every day. You shouldn't work every day because if you work every day, it's going to kind of train you to believe that that's what, that's all that life is. And work is a beautiful gift of God, but that's not all that life is. So he said, say, at once every seven days, you take a day off, the Sabbath day. You take a day and you rest. And again, if you want more information, particularly on the Sabbath, we preached a series on that just a few months ago. 
And you should go back and check it out. Um, I think as New Testament believers, we need to structure our lives in such a way that we can feel okay resting sometimes. Because like, if you feel like you can't rest, then it's hard to say that you're really trusting God with your life because you feel like you gotta do it. And we're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to be an example of the fact that we can rest because our God never has to. He's strong and he can handle it. So every seven days, they're required to rest. Now, again, for the Israelites, not only did they rest once every seven days, they also rested for a whole year once every seven years. Um, most of them were farmers. And God said, hey, listen, for the good of the land, and any of you from, from Bear Grass like myself who knows a thing or two about agriculture, this actually is very scientifically good for the land, as well as for the people. Once every seven years, you don't plant anything in your fields. You just let the fields rest. And that reproduces all the minerals and nutrients and, and good stuff in the soil. And it also gives you a chance to reconnect with the most important things. What are the most important things? The most important things are people. People. Your family is the most important thing. Your friends are the most important things. And if you're always working, you don't have time to connect with the most important things. And so every seven years, Israel would take a year and they wouldn't plant things in their fields and they would, they would kind of rest. And some of you are like, well, how could they survive? How, I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could take a year off every seven years? But like, it just don't mathematically add up, right? How could they survive if they do that? Well, God told the people of Israel, and again, most of them were farmers, said, if you will trust me, I will produce so much food for you in the sixth year that you won't need to plant anything in the seventh year. You'll have enough to like, I'll, I'll make two years worth of stuff in the sixth year. And so like, it's really, it's really about, do you trust God to provide for your life? Now, not many of you have lands and fields. Maybe some of you do, but that's not typical for a modern day American, middle-class American to have lots of lands and fields and farms and stuff like that. So what does this have to do with you? Do you trust God with your life is what it has to do with you. And the truth is, look, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but I am trying to open our eyes so we can see the truth. Most American Christians do not trust God with their provision. They just don't. They just don't. They don't trust him. And they feel, they, they, I mean, they feel all this enormous amounts of pressure to get, 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 get. Because there's never, ever enough. And look, I, I don't, again, like we gotta fight that, y'all. We have to be a people that trust and believe in God. And so now, once every seven days, once every seven years. And then we got dive into this. God was saying, okay, so once every seven years, you let the, the land rest and you trust me. And by the way, that's the kind of overarching theme of today is do we trust God and, and what do we do when we trust God? And they say, well, we'll do a special thing every seven times seven. So every 49 years, so there's been seven years of sevens, then we're gonna have an even more special, significant time. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. And in that time, not only are you gonna let the, the fields rest and are you gonna rest, but um, you're gonna have this day called the Day of Atonement. And what the Day of Atonement was is anyone who had to sell property because times were tough, they would get their property back. Because the property did not belong to any individual person. The property really belonged to God. It was God's. And he was letting people use it. And he was letting families use it. And so if you needed to sell some of your fields so that you could make ends meet for a little while, on the Day of Atonement, you got your fields back. And all the produce that came from the fields, you would get that back. And because of the Day of Atonement, families would come together and they'd have this thing called the Year of Jubilee. And if you wonder wondering what the Year of Jubilee is, people would come together, all the debts had been cleared, and people would party for a whole year and celebrate the fact that anything that they lost, our God is a redeemer who brings it back to us. And so, again, if you can't see Jesus already in this, then it's okay. I mean, he's just like, we have a God that loves to redeem things and bring them back to us. We have a God who loves to take our debts and he loves to clear it and wipe it away as though it never existed so that we can be free. And we have a God who loves it when his family, when his family comes together. Now, some of you, you came from what I'm about to say, and it's another little bit of a soapbox moment. Forgive me for having them today, but it's so good. God believes in the power of the family. The power of the family is so important. Um, I would dare say, and this is an opinion, so it means it's probably wrong, but you know, I do my best to be as studied and wise and prayerful as I can. If it's anything that I bring to you, I do believe that so, again, America, I'm so thankful, we're so blessed, but I do believe that so many of our problems, they would go away immediately if we revalued family. Because family is not valued in our culture. It is not valued in our family. And so I just wanna speak first to my brothers. My brothers, be the man of God that God made you to be. Be the husband that God made you to be. If you don't do anything else other than love your wife and lead your wife well, you have lived an exceptional life. 
exceptional life. Lead your children well, love them well, let them know that you're devoted to their life, that you're involved in their life, and that you have their best in mind and their heart in mind. Like, we are in a culture and a generation where kids don't know that their dads love them. And kids don't know that their dads are involved. Now, some of you are excellent at that. Like, a lot of men in our generation, they, we, need to, we need to step up. And my sister, it's the same for you. Like, like value your family. Like, yeah, go be, like, we have a culture, and my sisters tell you, you can, you can be anything you want to be. And I echo that, you can be anything you want to be. But there is nothing any better than being an incredibly godly woman, a godly wife, and a godly mother. There's nothing better than that. You be anything you want to be. But not the cost of not being able to be those things, because those are the best things that you can be. Those things make generational differences. And most of the things that we do, that we so passionately pursue, we'll do it for a little while, and then nobody else is going to know our name or care in the next generation about what we did, how much product we sold, how many things we like, Nobody cares. You raise your children, your family well. It makes a difference forever. And so in this time of Jubilee, families would come together. And that's, a, that's something that we can learn about as well. So again, as we go into our points today, like the main body of our text, I just want you to kind of have those things in mind. Like God, God wants us to trust him. And as we trust him, it's going to change some of the ways we live. And God really cares that we be a people that bring family. And some of you, your families are very, very broken, or maybe your families are gone. You have a family of faith, and that's just as real. As a matter of fact, the family of faith, if I'm being honest with you, and look, I say this as someone who has four children and an amazing wife and, I, and great you know, uh, brothers, sisters, the family of faith is actually more real because it's forever. It's forever. So if you're here today and you don't feel like you have family, you have family. Somebody say amen to that. You have family. Like, and it's an eternal family. So we're going to talk about those things. It's going to be so good. So uh, point number one, for those of you who like writing things down in the outline and, and, and follow along with me, and I appreciate that. Um, in light of the fact that God wants to trust us and God wants to bring his family back uh, t- together, this is what we can learn from the Day of Atonement in the Year of Jubilee. We are God's debtor. So we're the ones that have a debt to him and we forgive others their debts to us. So like we owe something to God. We owe something to God. Like, there, like he, he, you know, we, the truth is if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, it's because you recognize that your sin caused you to have a debt that was owed to God. And because he forgave us of our debt to him, we should forgive the debts of others that they have against us. Um, in, in the year of atonement, um, people were forgiven of all their debts. Um, and so people who were having a hard time, they had an opportunity to wipe the slate clean. It was really, really beautiful. So let me just read it for you, and then we'll talk about what it means to us today. Leviticus 25, starting with verse 25. It says, if one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions, if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, like, then he may redeem what his brother sold. And so just there, in other words, it's saying like somebody's poor, they need to like, you know, give away some land, get some, get some you know, money right now. Um, they're just saying, hey, somebody in the family might want to buy it back. And if that's the case, even if the land is more valuable than what you paid for it. So, you know, Bob, Bob, you know, needs to make some money. He has land that's worth 15,000. I get it for 10 because he's real desperate. And now I have the land and I know it's valued at 15 and I got it for 10. He said, hey, if his relative comes and wants to pay you for the land back, don't charge him extra. Just give it back to him, okay? And then he goes and continues to say him, but if he's not able to have it restored, then what is sold, it shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, it shall be released and he shall return his possession. Now, this is really beautiful, but it's, it, it is against everything that is in us as humans. So now let me spell it out what it's meant for the Israelites. You have a piece of farmland and let's just assume maybe it wasn't well taken care of. So it was not producing what it should. And the family owned this piece of farmland and it's not producing very well. So because of that, they're struggling financially and they need help. And so they come to me and they say, hey, Jason, we need help. We need someone to buy this land from us. It's just not doing well. And so I pay them for it. I pay them for the land and I start investing in the land. I start, you know, putting the right type of fertilizer in the land. I start pouring into, you know, myself into the land. I, I take care of it. I, I really take care of this land. And all of a sudden, you know what, you know what now? It starts producing, y'all. It starts producing and things start growing in it. And all of a sudden it's, 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 it's producing fruit and I'm making money. And like, it was a good investment for me. And I took care of my friends, paid them what it was worth and everything is good. And now the year of Jubilee comes and it's time for me to give them their field back. But they gave me a wasteland and I'm giving them a paradise. 
And that's not typically what we want to do, right? Because they didn't, they didn't spend the years developing it. I did. They didn't spend the years toiling and sweating and pouring into it. I did. So why do I have to give it back to them? Because there's a God who gave everything for me. And I got I to gotta, I gotta treat other people the way that God treats me. And it doesn't matter. They don't, well, they, don't deserve, they don't deserve it, Jason. They didn't work as hard as you. It don't matter about what we deserve. It matters about what's right. What do we deserve in relationship to God? What we deserve, and I'm so sorry if you don't like me saying this, but it's just true. What we deserve is hell. That's what we deserve. Like, like, but Jesus died in our place so that we could have heaven. And so some of you are like, Jason, I don't have any land. This don't mean anything to me. What's this? You might not have any debt of land, but there are people in your life that have hurt you, and it's hard to forgive them. Every time you see them, you think about what they did to you, and they haven't even said they're sorry about it. They haven't even said they're sorry about it. They hurt you. They betrayed you. They backstabbed you. They went on the internet and did something you know, to you, like, and they haven't even said they're sorry. And what I'm telling you is, because Jesus forgave you, you got to forgive them. You got to forgive them. Well, Jason, you don't understand. My situation is different. No, no. Everything that has been done to you by someone else, you've done it to God. And he forgave you. We have to be a people that lead in forgiveness. And some of you are like, well, no, Jason, I'll forgive them if they tell me they're sorry. But shouldn't they come and tell me they're sorry? No. Before any of us said sorry, Jesus died first. He died first. And none of us had said we're sorry yet. He wasn't waiting for us to apologize. He did what was right. And now we've been saved and we got to do what is right. And so like what we learn from this is that if anyone has a debt against us, some of, some of you, you might have someone that has a financial debt against you. Pray about it. Talk to them about it. But ultimately, for any of us to let a financial debt ruin a relationship with a brother or sister is a very foolish thing to do. But even if you don't have that, all of us have had someone in our life that has hurt us. And we got to forgive them and love them. And when they say, why are you doing this? You say, because Jesus did it for me. Like, it's so important that we remember we always have owed God a debt and he's forgiven us and we have to forgive others. So some of you can write this down. This is something that I feel like the Holy Spirit brought to me. Maybe it'll be helpful to you. Um, the easiest way to become cold to others is to forget how warm Christ was to us. It's easy to be cold to others. People are messed up. People are hard. And I mean, even good people. You get around me long enough, I will mess up in front of you. I will let you down. I will promise something and not come through. Every one of us, all of us humans, are easy to be cold to. But the way we're warm is remembering how warm Jesus was to us, even when we were so broken and so cold ourselves. We are God's debtor, and we forgive those who have debts to us. So who do you need to call? Who do you need to write? Who do you need to visit? What do you need to do so that if there's anything between you and another person, you can make it right so there's nothing between you and God? Number one. Number two, because of the fact that God wants us to trust him, because of the fact that God wants us to be in a place of peace and rest and family and connectedness and celebration, we are God's family and we practice hospitality. We are God's family. And because we're God's family, we're called to practice hospitality and treat other people like they're a part of the family. And this has nothing to do with bloodlines and last names and creeds and colors and socioeconomic statures. It has, no, all, every one of you in this room, any of you watching online, we are one great human family made by one God intended to be in fellowship with each other and with him. And we come up with all kinds of good reasons to us of why we need to be separate. But in heaven, we're not gonna be separate. <laughs> And we should be living out the reality that we're one family now in every way we can. See, um, hospitality is a value that I do believe is unfortunately, um, it's one of those ones that's it's, it's kind of disappearing in my opinion. And it makes me say old, sound old to say that, but I guess I am getting there. So uh, I can say that. Um, the South has always been known as a place of hospitality, but I believe the enemy very, very, very much um, desires that, uh, that we not continue to be a place of hospitality. Um, any of you who are a little bit old school, you, know, you, you're, you remember the days in person or you remember the shows on TV, Andy Griffith, Mayberry Days. Yeah, I miss Mayberry, sitting on the porch drinking ice cold cherry Coke. Anybody, you know what I'm saying? Everything was black and white. Donna. Oh, no, Rascal Flatts fans. Okay, it's okay. Uh, it's all right. Uh, now, let's talk about Mayberry for a second. Let's talk about Mayberry. I'm gonna pick on Mayberry. I, 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 my, 
whenever I visited my, my grandmother and my grandfather, unless the Atlanta Braves were playing, because my granddad was a super fan for the Braves, unless the Braves were playing, Andy Griffith was on TV all the time at their house. They loved Mayberry. Here's the thing about Mayberry, y'all. The people of Mayberry were not any more friendly than we are today. Do you know why people in Mayberry were sitting on the front porch drinking ice cold lemonade and waving to their neighbors? It's because it's summertime and there's no air conditioning and it's 105 degrees in their house. That's why. That's why they're on the porch drinking ice cold cherry coke to lemonade and waving to their neighbors because they cannot live inside their house because there's no air conditioning. And you want to know why they invite their neighbors over and they, they spend hours talking to their neighbors? It's not because they're more friendly than us. It's because there were three channels on TV and all of them stunk. All of them. Awful. Black and white, awful television. And I, 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 we laugh, like, there's a seriousness to that. Like, it was better to spend time with other people in real life than get in front of a screen in the 50s. But guess what? We don't live in the 50s. We live in 2024. And let's just be honest here. We should be honest in church. It is better to my flesh to spend time with Netflix than with you. I can be so entertained, so engaged. I can travel to fantastical worlds. And I mean, they're well done. I can find so much entertainment and fulfillment. They, those shows, they can make me laugh. They can make me cry. I can put on reality TV. We know how real that is. And I can get all the drama I'd ever need. I don't need real people. I got all of it. And I don't think that's an accident. I, I think it shows the trajectory of this world. Isolate yourselves. Sit alone. Stare at a screen all day. Many of you since, since the coronavirus, you don't even go to work. Your work, you, you, you literally, your interactions even with your fellow employees are all through the barrier of the screen. That makes it so much more important that we have living people around us intentionally, that we, that we practice hospitality, that you have people over in your home and that you invite people to be a part of your life. And look, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's hard to have people in your home and it's hard to have people in your life. It's hard, but it's so good. And we need to be leading the way in reminding the world, this world that is becoming more and more screen-oriented, that the most important thing are people, real people that we can have real relationship with. Let me take you to the scriptures here. It says in Leviticus 25, 35, if one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, you help him. So, so there's a couple things here. You need to know him well enough to know what's going on in the story. And so you, so you can help him. And this is like a stranger or a sojourner. Israel was encouraged to be a nation that when someone was coming to visit or someone was passing through, they didn't have to worry about how they were going to eat and where they were going to stay. The whole nation was determined we are going to be people that love other people and to take care of other people whenever we can. And they may live with you. Don't take any ursery or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. Don't lend him your money for ursery but, or, or lend your food at a profit. I'm the Lord your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I gave you the land of Canaan, and I am your God. So just very briefly, what God is saying here is like, listen, people around you are gonna have times where they need you in their life. And so you need to structure your life in such a way. As a part of my royal priesthood, you need to structure your life in a way that you can be the priest to other people when they need it. That you can help them when they need it. That you can invite them into your life when they need it. That you can feed them something if they're hungry. So that, and I'm not talking about just physical food, although that's good. Like, we live in a place where people are hungry all the time for something. Have we structured our life in a way that we can feed them, that we can be there to meet their need? What the world would have us do is be so absorbed in ourselves that we miss our brother and sister in need. If you've been a part of Ignite for a while and heard my teaching for a while, um, I talk about people. In my flesh, this is what people are. And in your flesh, this is what people are for you too. And if you don't agree, then I think you're lying to yourself. And uh, we need to, I can have truth. Here's what people are to me in my flesh. Typically, they're either scenery or machinery. Well, some are like, well, what do you mean by that? Number one, scenery. Take a second and stop looking at me and just look around. You're in a room full of hundreds of people. Who are they in your story? If we're honest, if we are honest, the way our natural bent and our natural flesh is, all these other people in this room, they are just a backdrop to your story because your story is the story. That's why we naturally feel. And I'm just another one of those people in the background that you come and listen to for an hour in your life. And I'm just, just you know, I'm a backdrop. I'm a backdrop, a character. I'm a backdrop character in the drama of your life that shows up every once in a while and yells at you. 
You're welcome, by the way, for that. It's awesome. It's great. That, that's how we, or machinery. Machinery is there are people that, they're not backdrop. They're doing something for us. And as long as they're doing their thing well, because you know, when machines work well, we're happy with our machines. We expect our machines to do what they were made to do. Your waiter is made to bring you ice cold water and food on time and expect very little tip because it's Sunday and Christians, we never tip on Sunday. <laughs> like, like, we, we expect them to do that. We expect, we expect things to be a certain way. And when people don't meet our expectations, we feel very frustrated at them because machines need to do what they're supposed to do. But, but nobody's scenery or machinery. We're people. And you have the capacity today, my, my fellow royal priest, some of you, you're gonna leave this time and you're gonna go to this most delightful meal. And I'm serious, I this is like my favorite, called brunch, it's the best. You can, you can, you can get you know, omelets or you can get a sandwich or you can get, you can get both. Brunch is like, it's the best. Like, um, some of you are gonna be real hungry and it's okay. Like, some of you are gonna go out and get brunch after a service. And there's a person that's probably gonna interact with you while you're doing that. And you get to determine, are they just a backdrop to my story or a machine that I'm expecting them to do something for me? Or am I actually gonna see them for what they are? An eternal soul that God loves that I can be a blessing to their life. I can be a blessing to their life. I can be a blessing at Walmart, at Target, at IHOP, at whatever you are. I can be a blessing. I can be a priest to them. They all have family. They all have friends. They all have a story. There's always something to pray. I can do that. Or I can be irritated that they took five minutes too long to bring me what they told me they were gonna bring me. Or they took that parking spot that I righteously know belonged to me and they slid into it. They're criminals. How could they steal that from me? You know, like we, we can view people those ways. And you have a choice and I have a choice how we view the world. We're called to be reminded we are a family, a human family. And we should be passing hospitality to our brothers and our sisters. And finally, last point for the day. We are God's servants. And we're servants who set other captives free who free people from servanthood and bondage. Now, the first part, it's not very fun. The second part, it's like so worth your life and it's so fun. Let me start with the hard part. You are always in bondage to something, either your sin or to the Holy Spirit. That's what you get to decide. It is not a free world. Some of you are like, no, it's a free nation. It's a free world, it's a free life. Well, you can, you can, you can ride your freedom all the way again to where the devil lives <laughs> if you wanna do that. But the truth is, if you don't belong to Jesus, and I say belong to him, then you belong to sin. And for those of us who belong to Jesus, we're part of his kingdom. He's the king and we're not. And we belong to him. Here's the great thing about being a, a, a servant in the service of a great king, though. His glory and honor are, are shared by us. Um, I'm, a, again, uber nerd. So here's how I think of it, and this might help some of you. I'm sorry to my sisters. This is a more masculine uh, example, but I'm a, I'm a man, so I'm sorry. It's just kind of how God made me, and that's the way it is. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a big nerd, and um, I really resonate with this, with, with the samurai. If you don't know anything about samurai, you don't have to, but the, the samurai are like no wimps. Like, samurai, if you, if you were a man in Japan, you wanted to be a samurai. They are the toughest. They are the strongest. They are the richest. They are the most powerful. They are the, they're the best of the best, like incredible warriors, most educated. The samurai are the best, but the root of the word samurai, the root of the word samurai is sabara, and sabara means servant. So some are like, well, what is that? These men who had been blessed realize I've been blessed to serve others who aren't blessed as much as me. These men who are strong realize I've been made strong to defend the weak who aren't as strong as me. Those who had possessions, I've been given much to share with others who haven't been given as much as me. So yeah, so I've been elevated, but I'm supposed to be a servant to everyone with what has been given to me. You have been blessed with much. You have hope and life and joy and peace and eternity in heaven. You have the Holy Spirit living within you, the blood of Jesus covering you. You have been given much, not just for you. You've been given so that you can share it, y'all. And so like for us to be servants who are committed to serving our master well so that the whole world can be free, there's nothing better for us to live for. So let me read our final scripture and then we'll like put feet to the word today. Leviticus 25, starting at verse 39 says, if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, because like that was the ultimate, like you, you've run out of property to sell, you're still not able to make ends meet. And so there were at times, especially men who would say, hey, 
pay, pay my family, I will, I will serve you my, the rest of my life. I'll go and be in your household and I'll serve you. It's, I've, sold, I've sold themselves to you. you. Don't compel him to serve like a slave. Don't, don't treat him like a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he will be with you. And he shall serve until the year of Jubilee. In other words, while he's in your house, instead of treating him like a slave, you treat him like a brother and you realize from the moment you bring him in that he's not gonna stay in your household forever because he doesn't belong to you, he belongs to God. So you treat him that way. And then he shall, he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and he will return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers because they are my servants. I love that, you should underline that. Understand, like, hey, this person, you might have hired them to serve you, but they don't belong to you, they belong to me. They're mine. And you're just, you're just borrowing their services for a moment. I, bought, I, bought, I brought them out of the land of Egypt. They won't be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over them with rigor. You shall fear the Lord your God. So all that is to say, like, again, like, how are we going to treat the people around us? Even those that, that maybe should be serving us. We should treat others. Again, how Jesus treated us. Because in our brokenness, he brought healing. In our darkness, he brought light. In our death, he brought life. In our hopelessness, he brought hope. And we should be reflections of that to everyone around us. And so let me give you some suggestions of how you can serve others well. And um, my wife will be in the next service. And so y'all pray for me that with integrity, I'll say what I'm about to say to you in front of her because she'll hold me accountable to it in a way that the rest of you uh, cannot. Um, and it's just being real. I'm just being honest with you. Um, so my wife did not marry a sports guy. I'm more of an ESPN recap guy than a go home on Sunday and watch football all day kind of guy. Some of you are those kind of guys and God bless you. Um, you can invite me to go watch the game with you and we'll see what happens. But like typically that's not like what I do uh, for relaxation and for fun. Um, I'm, I'm more nerdy than that. I'm more of a gamer kind of guy. Uh, so I love, I love, love video games. And, uh, Call of Duty, which is a first-person shooter video game, which is incredibly violent and probably no Christians should play, but I am admitting that I play it. Uh, it just came out. The brand new one just came out this week. And so this weekend, Pastor Jason has been shooting lots of zombies, y'all, and it's been so fun. It's been so fun. It's been so fun. But I'm, because it's a new thing and I like it, guess what I'm tempted to do whenever I don't clearly have something to do? And is, it, is it to be with my family? Is it to invest in my wife? It's to get in front of a TV and zone out like a zombie myself. And I need, and you need, all of us need, we need to, we need to invest in the things that are most important. So here's number one. We serve God first. Serve God first. First. First part of your day. Best part of your life. Like serve him first. It is a lie to say you don't have time to serve God. You do. You'd just rather cut on the video game like me. But you don't have to do that. We can serve God first. Next, we serve our family. And so like I'm, com I'm committing like today is gonna be a day I'm not gonna get on that game. I'm gonna just be with my family. And because, because I'm just not cutting on this thing, I'm gonna have, a, I'm gonna have more time and, and energy and priority with them. And that's the way it should be. Not that the game's evil, but it should be in its right place. It shouldn't be in front of my family. It should be behind all other responsibilities. So God, family, serve work. Again, like for us to be the royal priest in our work, you can. You can be the person of prayer in your work. You can be the person that cares about your other employees. You can be that person if you will put priority. But again, most of us, what we do when we get the stack done, um, some of you are like, I never get the stack done. I'm praying for you if you know it's so good. You get your stack done on your desk. You know what you want to do? You don't want to go and pray for people. You want to veg out, play solitaire, look at a YouTube video. I get it. I'm not saying those things are bad. But you've, you've, you've pushed your papers for the day and you know the person beside you, their marriage is on the rocks. Why can't you take two minutes and pray for them? You can, and you will forever be a different person to them and to their family if you do that. And then finally, we serve the world. You notice I didn't put ourselves. If you were gonna put yourself on there, it's after everybody else. There is time to rest. There is, there, there is time to enjoy things. There's time. But make sure as a servant who's been served, we have our priorities Right, we serve because Jesus first served us.